Good afternoon again, everyone. For those of you who joined us over the past few weeks, welcome back. If you're new to this, then uh, welcome. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the Executive Director of the Ivy Academy. That's the learning and development wing of Ivy Business School at Western in London. Uh, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your day. We, we, you know, we really hope you get some value here. If you've been tuning into these sessions the last few weeks, you'll know that we're, we're kind of trying to figure out uh, what to do sort of like everyone else. I, you know, I would say we're getting there a bit now. There's a little more clarity week by week on what the world is, is going to look like and, and some time frames. Um, if you want kind of a personal view based on a whole lot of scenario planning work that I'm doing, conversations with clients, uh, you know, here in Canada, around the world, you know, I think from here out, people are going to have and organizations are going to have more and more starting to have individual experiences in the, in the COVID world. It's going to be less about macro trends and, and government rules from here and more about organization by organization and person by person interpretation of, of guidelines and risks and what they themselves deem acceptable and, and appropriate. Some organizations, you know, we've already heard about imposing travel bans sort of no matter what happens, others are really raring to grow, rare, raring to go and, you know, and so on and so forth. So you're gonna see financial resilience, shrewd planning, you know, looking for edges and opportunities. Uh, that, that's what's next for some and, you know, so others and sort of, pure survival mode, you know, in other words, I think there are going to be fewer patterns and more what looks like randomness in, in the response or messiness in the response, which makes it quite hard to plan for, hard to market to, you know, et cetera, the, the kinds of things that we think about in, in sort of the business world. And, and so, at, you know, at the center of all this is a need for facts and, and for information and for very informed views and all, all of these to help people make organizations make really good decisions. Um, you know, and also, and also to, to hold some folks accountable. That, that's, that's always been the role of media. It, it, very interesting times uh, for our, our friends in media, to say the least. So today we're lucky to be joined by three of the bigger names in, in media in Canada. We'll be talking about the impact of COVID on the space itself, media space itself right now, and you know, maybe some likely longer term impacts and what those could look like. So let, let's meet our guests today. We, we've got another all-star uh, panel here set and ready to roll. Paul Wells is the senior editor of McLean's Magazine in more than two decades on the Hill. In Ottawa, Paul has covered seven federal elections, three prime ministers, and a big piece of Canada's history. Paul's won three gold national magazine awards, a national newspaper award. He's a Western alum and a grad of uh, Institut d'Etudes at Politique at, in Paris. He's on the advisory committee of the New London School of Public Affairs and a fellow of the New School of Public Policy and Governance at UP but we won't hold uh, any of that against him. Susan Delaporte, also with us. Susan is an Ottawa-based columnist for The Star, uh, where she has been covering politics on Parliament Hill since the 80s, uh, a political science grad of Western. She's written four political books. Uh, her latest, Shopping for Votes, was a finalist for the 2014 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize in nonfiction. Susan's also a regular commentator. You've probably seen her on CBC and CTV, sought journalism and uh, political communication at Carleton University. And then uh, rounding out our panel, we have Troy Reeb. Troy is the Executive Vice President of Broadcast Networks at Chorus Entertainment Inc, uh, covering Chorus' 34 specialty uh, TV networks, 39 radio stations, 15 conventional stations, and, and the online platforms. Troy was previously SVP News Radio and Station Operations. Troy graduated uh, from broadcast journalism at Lethbridge, where he was named distinguished alumni in 2003 and maintains an internship program there to this day. He successfully completed a uh, broadcast executive leadership program at Bant Center in 2007, where Nazi Raz uh, was, and then uh, the cable executive management program at, at Harvard in 2015. So uh, three really, really great guests. Uh, I, I'm excited about this one. As always, I'm going to uh, host and moderate. We, we also have our executive producer, as always, Sean Ackley Grant with us. Sean's going to keep track of and do a big curation of questions that come in through the chat and the Q&A. And then Sean and I will come in from themes that emerge. But it, Sean, can we just go to you for a few words on, on how this is all really going to work today, please? Sure. Thanks, Mark. And welcome, everyone. I want to start by pointing out the Q&A icon at the bottom of the window. Uh, if you double click that, you'll get an open panel where you can uh, submit your own questions and upvote other questions you like. We'll be watching that throughout the broadcast and, and doing our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, we'll also be posting the full broadcast and a follow-up article on our blog at ivyacademy.com. So if you're not able to stay for the whole session, you can catch up there and uh, maybe get some of the extra questions answered as well. Um, feel free to use the chat to, uh, to communicate with each other. We've got a bunch of folks logged in this morning. So uh, 
thanks for joining us and back to you mark yeah, thanks sean so you know a few territories we want to we want to cover today in, in this session talk a bit about the current state of uh of media during this time talk a bit about the responsibility of media and, and then sort of get to the future so if we maybe we start with current state and you know, it, it might be an overstatement to say that the need for accurate information has never been more important, but it is certainly important now in, the, in this weird time. Uh, you know, I think I've read that readership continues to rise. In fact, traffic to new sites is, is way up. You have fragmentation of the business model, you have fragmentation of facts. And so, you know, Susan, I was hoping we could, we could start with you and then everyone else kind of chime in. As a journalist, you know, who or what do you rely on for, for credible sources of information? And, and accurate facts in these weird times. Everybody who's here. Um, uh, it will sound a little self-interested, but uh, uh, I rely on the media. I rely on people who pay people to uh, to go through and, uh, and get the facts and not just throw out anything willy-nilly. Um, I rely more so on the media now and less so on social media. I think uh, there's a lot of reckoning that's happening in this uh, pandemic. There's a lot of fault lines being exposed. And I think that um, just as it is, um, this whole thing has been exposing sort of the weaknesses in our society generally, I think we're seeing the weak links in the chain of information too. And I think the job has been never more important to, uh, to have information from governments, information from your community, information from the ground uh, about what is going on out there. I think people also are at home. They, are, they have lots more chance to consume the news and to be discerning consumers of the news. And uh, we are not only if uh, there's a huge obligation on us and we are being judged and I, I think you know I'm going to trusted sources myself and I'm uh, relying less on you know the uh, the churn of fake news through social media. Paul, Paul or Troy do you want to jump in here? Um, I, uh, I've, I've developed a lot of the same habits that Susan has. I, I, I think probably the most valuable um, uh, news source is essentially the horse's mouth. Uh, the daily news conferences, whether it's uh, you know Trudeau from the cottage or the federal government or pick your favorite provincial government, um, uh, I know that the daily news conference that Francois Legault gives in Quebec is called La Grande Mess, the, the the Great Mass, because everybody uh, everybody shows up for it. Um, and what we found at McLean's, where we're able to track the readership that anything that we publish gets online. Um, our transcript of the Prime Minister's daily statement would routinely get quite a bit more readers than anything else, which, I mean, to some extent is surprising because everyone's got 30 places they can find out what the Prime Minister said. They could go to CPAC, they could go to the, the, the cable channels, they could, uh, uh, you know, watch it on the on Prime Minister's social feeds. And yet even then, with a tiny, with, with you know, uh, uh, a piece of information that we were sharing quite broadly with other, with other sources, it was the, the, the most closely read for a long time, a little bit less now. I think people are, people have figured out the shape of this crisis and they know a little bit more what it entails. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, whenever things get serious, I tend to go up the slope of, uh, authority. I, I, I pay less attention to random noise, what friends are posting on Facebook. I go to the New York Times, I go to specialty. So I've been spending more time than I ever thought I would on the Journal of the American Medical Association website. Um, because it's just, it's, it's like, it's like sticking your hand in a coffee grinder to understand what they're saying. But you know that they're uh, not messing around. And so it's worth the effort. Um, but I, 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 I do think a lot of people are trying to get the most reliable information that they can. I would say, you know, maybe just some, let's just offer some basic consumption numbers right now from the electronic sphere since the advent of COVID-19. So since mid-March, uh, television ratings overall uh, are up about 10% in Canada. 
which the uh, 10% is actually a huge lift for the amount of people watching television. And it's uh, even more significant when you consider there is no more live sports on TV. Like one of the <laughs> biggest drivers of, of viewing in the past was sports and that's gone. And yet Canadians are still watching 10% more television. And in fact, the news channels have replaced the sports channels in the top five most viewed channels in Canada for the last two months. Uh, and over and above that, you know, I, I take for our newscasts at Global, uh, the Global Toronto newscast is double its pre-COVID ratings, Global Nationals uh, up 60%. I'm sure these are numbers that are repeated at the other networks as well. And the fact is that Canadians are, to, um, uh, to Paul and Susan's points, gravitating more to mass media. And there's a reason for that. And uh, while it's always enjoyable, it's self-satisfying for people to seek out more niche forms of information that you know, caters to their personal tastes and biases during times of crisis, um, you know, just to have your own biases fed back at you is not necessarily helpful. And the one thing for, for all of its flaws, the one thing that mass media outlets do is try to target messages to the masses overall. That's the very definition. And in doing that, they have to have messages that are palatable, acceptable, and verified for the masses overall. And that does tend to lead to a, another layer of, uh, of fact checking and trustworthiness. Is it, is it tougher now? You know, it, we, I think we've all sort of said it's kind of more important now than, than normal. Is it tougher now with layoffs and outlets um, you know, un, under significant financial duress? I mean, you know, the little town that I live in, the, the paper here was, was shuttered during a, you know, an announcement of a, a bunch of community, community and smaller outlet papers uh, three weeks ago. You know, how do you, how do you look at the responsibility to get news to people as the industry is sort of being forced shrunk through, through layoffs and other actions? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just, start. Okay, go, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, look, the, 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 first off, we have this paradox, all those great uh, audience increase numbers that we just talked about, are uh, we have this paradox that we have a plethora of audience and very, very little advertising right now. Businesses are closed, traditional advertisers are trying to protect their cash. Um, I just saw numbers from the radio sector, which are absolutely jaw dropping at the level of uh, of revenues that have disappeared from private radio stations in Canada. Uh, I'm sure that's the same in newspapers. Television's a little bit more stable, but not a lot. So um, the number one thing that has held up the media sector, the number one uh, way that it gets revenues is actually under tremendous duress right now, uh, even at a time of uh, when it's most in need. So yeah, I, I have to be careful about not uh, sharing sort of uh, like we all do about uh, discussions that have been going on uh, at the business level, which I'm not paid enough to help decide, I should say as well. But I think it's an open secret that newspapers, even before this uh, pandemic, were trying to adjust the business model from paid by advertisers to paid by subscribers. Um, we need people to pay for news, which is not uh, something that people have grown accustomed to. Um, we need people to recognize that, that uh, there is a cost to doing journalism and to getting the journalism they want. So, or that I, uh, I distinguish too, I should say it's our old rant of mine. There is journalism that people want, which we can see by clicks. And there's journalism that people need, which doesn't often show up in clicks but uh, we are a business and a public service. And that's, again, just as the pandemic has made everything acute, it is showing the weaknesses in the business, but the strength of the need for the public service. And we are all wrestling with that right now. I think you're gonna see newspapers have already taken advantage and have been asking for some aid from the government, which is a controversial thing, even in my business. Um, but I think you're also going to see that um, that we're going to have to sort out this. You know, this is again to repeat the point. This is a time of reckoning, and if we want journalism to go on, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for it when people can't pay for anything, advertising or subscribing. Um, I think for the sake of keeping the conversation going, I'll just I'll just endorse what my colleagues said and not add much. Uh, it, it was already a very difficult time in uh, news media in, in the country. 
Um, and uh, uh, it's gotten like an order of magnitude more complex as a, as a business proposition for our owners. Uh, and, um, you know, as practitioners, we don't have to worry about that all the time, but we're always aware of it, that, that uh, our organizations are on shaky footing. Is it, is it a public good? Is the news media a highway? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I, I do believe it is a public good. I, I, don't, um, I, I don't think I would have lasted as long in the business if I didn't think it was a public good. I think um, uh, it's funny, when I first got into the business in the late 80s, that I came straight from the Western Gazette to the Globe and Mail, um, it was still a reasonably new thing that journalism was um, was a professional occupation. It was when I got to the Globe. It was mostly made up of people with kind of a cop culture, you know. And and the people, the practitioners of journalism, back when I uh, joined, first of all, hated people calling themselves journalists. They were all reporters, but they all kind of thought of themselves as cops, walking a beat doing the job of, um, of a community job. And then, you know, the 80s came along and it, and it turned into a, a very high paid and well rewarding business. And now we're, I had thought that what the internet would do was actually bump journalism back down to that old idea of kind of a blue collar public service job. Um, uh, but right now, I think I'm worried that we're skipping a step all the way to is it a job or not. But, but I, I do think that um, I grew up with the idea that journalism is a public service. I think I, I came into the business in the 80s in the culture where it was seen as a public service. Um, maybe not as high a calling as, as being a cabinet minister or an MP, but it certainly was the idea that you're doing a, you're doing a, you're performing a public function. I, I, I've been a bit of a dissenter on this. Um, look, I think most journalists are trying their, hard, or their hardest to be useful to readers and to the broader public conversation. Hmm. And uh, every day you see, a, you see dozens of examples of where they're absolutely doing that. Um, but if we don't kind of understand where we fit in the economy, then someone who has a, a more bloody minded view will just We'll just walk right around us and 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 and, and reach a market that, that, that we haven't. Um, newspapers, the, the the media in general, but your local newspaper. When I got into this business, roughly the same time Susan did, you'd pick up your newspaper and it would have um, uh, notices of, of of major public events, notices of uh, sales at the local stores. It would have uh, scores from last night's game, the stock market numbers. Uh, what's playing at the movie houses, whether those movies are any good, a bunch of stuff that you really didn't have a lot of alternatives but your local newspaper to go and get. Uh, where can I rent a truck or a van? Uh, you know, how can I, how can I buy a, a, a used TV if I don't want to get a new one? All that. Almost all of that you don't need a newspaper for anymore. And um, us wishing that it were otherwise is just not going to change that. Uh, and, um, and as I said, when the prime minister speaks, you don't need McLean's to tell you what the prime minister said anymore. And I'm, I'm frankly, uh, gratified that anyone goes through us to find out what the prime minister said. Um, you, you, you sure need, you sure need me to analyze what the prime minister said in a snarky fashion, uh, and bring all <laughs> of my, uh, all my years, uh, on Parliament Hill to that analysis. Um, but we... I think we mislead ourselves uh, when we when we lean too heavily on the notion that people need us, because they're showing that they don't, not as much. Yeah, and I think I think Paul and, and Susan have both hit on, uh, and, and I agree with both. And uh, the economics the economics of uh, media as an industry, uh, you know, was built uh, on the profitability of other parts of the business, whether it was entertainment programming and television, the music that was played on the radio, or the classified ads, movie listings, uh, syndicated columns, et cetera, et cetera, in newspapers. The trust in the brand of those outlets 
was built up on the on the reporting, what was in the A section of the paper, what was on the six o'clock newscast. And every local television station used to always spend all their promo time promoting how, you know, uh, the great quality of their local news and then make all their money on the other parts of their schedule. So the, the economics of the model for the longest time when there was a scarcity of delivery systems of media really supported this build your trust around the public service piece and then use that to make profit in the other parts of your business. And that's all been disintermediated. now, And that's the fundamental challenge of, uh, of media that it still clings to the idea. Uh, and it's an important ideal that we have to be, that we are providing a public service, but our ability to then convert that public service mandate into any meaningful dollars uh, has been blown apart by the internet. Can I, can I just um, edit Paul's, um, or gently correct Paul's view of what his job is? <laughs> um, Here we I think go. Here a, we go. We're into it now. I, I think, no, I'm going to be, uh, um, I'm a big fan of Paul Wells, and I don't think he just does snarky analysis. I think, um, I think that the job of journalism in, well, let me tell you a couple of things I think the job of journalism is. is one is what Paul Wells does very well, and he's done in books and columns, and all of us who are trying to do political journalism do, is help people sort through the huge array of information out there. The, uh, oddly, the, the greater the, 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 the preponderance of information right now, the more we need a Paul Wells to say, look, I see this, 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 and this, and here's what connects this dot. And uh, you know, the need is acute. Also, um, I say this uh, when I used to teach uh, political journalism and, uh, and I say it to new folks in Ottawa, trying not to be an idiot about it, but there's two sides to the job of a political reporter. One is conveying what politicians say to readers, um, which frankly I find is a less interesting job than finding out what people are what influences the politicians and what they're saying you know what what forces are acting on the politicians and this is where we need your paper in paris ontario to because the politicians are still paying attention they re regard the media and and not social media although it does play a little part to telling them what is happening on the ground that they should be caring about here and that is the part i was talking to a colleague of mine last night who lives in Quebec, and she was finding it very difficult to find out how many cases of COVID were in her own neighborhood. Uh, that's valuable information. And, uh, you know, we can all uh, log on to public health sites and things like that. But what you do need to loop back is somebody in there asking questions and helping people sort the information that's that's coming to them. So if we, if we use this as sort of a bridge back into this idea of responsible journalism now, you know, there's kind of two flavors of what we're talking about in the public good area. There's the public service aspect, and then there's the kind of holding governments and politicians accountable. And if you, if you imagine for a second, let's imagine a world where we figure out the business model later, magically, I don't know how, but we do, but we need a bridge. You know, how, who's, I guess, whose responsibility it is to walk the fine line between the bridge is gonna to have to be some sort of government support Right, but the sort of reverse direction is, but you know, I'm going to take your money, but now I'm going to. But by the way, I'm also going to hold you sort of accountable <laughs> for what you say on the way through. That's a that's sort of a tricky thing, no? Yeah, Paul, you want to? Sure. Paul has views on it's, this. It's it's super tricky, and I'll just say now, I I, mean, I hate government uh, uh, support for news organizations in the Canadian context. Hate it, hate it. It makes me angry. I've yelled at people in government over it. Uh, I spent. The chunk of last year looking for another job another another um line of work um uh, but unfortunately i'm kind of comfortable here um uh and finally what what helped me kind of reconcile with it is is the, it, like here's my problem i don't think the level of government support is enough to save news organizations that are going to fail anyway and i think it's more than ample enough to uh, shatter our credibility with some of our uh, readers and listeners. Uh, the notion that we're bought and paid for. Uh, every practitioner believes that they know that that's, that's not the case, uh, but a lot of the um, 
uh, a lot of our audience uh, views government support as liberal purchase of political support. Um, and I, I don't have an answer to those people, except I don't, that's not how I feel. Now, how did I finally learn to live with it? Um, well, the money's really good. No, um, <laughs> the, 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 I believe the people who are inclined to, 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 to find evidence that we've sold our, our soul would, would find that evidence anyway. Uh, the great American journalist, Michael Lewis, did a podcast last year called Breaking the Rules, in which he analyzed at length a sort of societal uh, erosion of trust in traditional um, uh, uh, sort of referee models, whether it's referees in sports or market regulators uh, and, and uh, various other models, uh, 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 election um, uh, re referee authorities and things like that. And what he found is that um, people are more and more cynical about the notion that anyone is impartial. And uh, it's true across fields and across disciplines and uh, it's accelerating in recent years. And I thought, well, look, if no one trusts anyone, then I shouldn't get too worked up about how people are not going to trust me. Uh, and all I can do is try to be trustworthy by trying to follow my own internal light about, uh, about uh, telling the truth. But I think government support for news organizations is highly problematic. And I wish we had had a serious uh, discussion about it before we apparently all decided we were going to go in for it whole hog. And uh, I only get one vote and I'm, I'm massively outvoted on this question. I know yeah. that in the prep, Troy talked a lot about genies in bottles and having it's it's hard to stuff them back in. I don't, I don't know, Troy, if you want to, if that's where you want to kind of take your take your response here, if you want to. Well, I was going to pick up on uh, Paul's point. Look, I'm also not a believer in government support for news organizations. It's highly problematic. Um, and uh, but to Paul's point, look, wait, that broadcasters are specifically precluded from uh, accessing the journalism tax credit that was announced by the government. So there is no for private broadcasters, at least obviously the CBC is the largest recipient of, uh, of government cash for journalism. Um, but private broadcasters are specifically precluded uh, from receiving that tax credit. Yet our journalists are tarred all the time with how they're just in journos, they're in the pocket, um, you know, and so the, the label sticks. And even for those who uh, it's pointed out that no, uh, we don't actually receive that money and can't uh, even apply for it, then the argument back is, well, it's just because you want it so bad. That's why you're so biased in favor of the liberals. <laughs> Um, so, so it's the same, it, it Paul's correct that, that people who are prone to those biases are probably going to, uh, reach them anyway, but it is, it is problematic. I actually think the, uh, the argument that's been put forward by the newspaper owners now, um, and which we are backing as well to, to tackle the problem at its source and try to redirect revenues from, from Google, from Facebook, from Apple, from Netflix, from the big foreign uh, media companies that reach into our territory, don't pay any taxes, don't remit any public good back. Um, that's probably a better effort. And it's interesting to see the Europeans are attempting that with copyright. Uh, the Australians are attempting it with competition law. I don't know that either of those efforts are going to be successful, but that would be a far more palatable user pay solution than, uh, than is the you know, sort of direct subsidy model. Yeah, a very, uh, a very smart friend of mine works at CBC, also a Western grad, um, actually told me about a year ago, again, all of us have been having this, I get letters um, every day that I am a paid state Justin Trudeau journalist. And that's mostly because Rebel Media is putting it out uh, regularly. I find it interesting that, <clears throat> that, that, that uh, group is posing as the media to be credible rather than um, while well, trying to take the credibility of the media down, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, anyway, the smart idea was it would be far better to subsidize the people who want to consume news rather than the people who produce it. Um, so um, I think I'd be more comfortable too with government aid if it was more aimed at making it easier or for people to pay for news, which is the fundamental problem. Uh, Troy is right though, there's a great article in the New York Times uh, this week about how Australia is moving on, on, um, on 
tackling the problem of Facebook and Google. Our deputy prime minister, uh, who is a former journalist, has talked about uh, this idea too, that they've been getting away with murder uh, in, in taking our content and, and distributing it for free without paying for journalists. So I, I think there's a whole bunch of knots tied up in this conversation about state sponsorship of media. And what I think the way to sort through it is, uh, do you want to help the people consume news more, which would be a great idea. We are also a business uh, and we're people. I have observed sometimes in the heat of moments on, uh, on Twitter or social media, we're the only business where people actually cheer when people are laid off, um, you know, <laughs> uh, including politicians who will say, ha, it serves you right. Um, but I think we, we've got to get our heads around the idea that we are a business with workers in there who need to be paid to work. And we do need a system. If we want to keep that system alive, people are going to have to pay for news. How do we do that? That's the million dollar question. And how do we make the big giants pay for the news they're taking for free from us? I think if you want to make me mad, by the way, just put up a paywall on Twitter. It drives me crazy. I, I want to walk into Starbucks and say, ugh, paywall. Right? Like how, well, I'd love to walk from Starbucks anyway right now, but um, but it, it's just the, the idea that it's, it's disgusting to ask people to pay for news is somehow something I would like to dispel. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this a, a bit in the prep, right? How the airline industry got themselves in this boat and it took them a long time to get themselves out where they tra train people that you can fly point to point in Europe for $20, which is not right. a real yeah. thing either. I, I think, if, you know, if, Susan, if you want to avoid the, you know, the accusation of it being a paid hack, you take the, the Paul Wells approach, you just be cranky with everyone and then <laughs> yeah. no, one will, no one will accuse you of that. Um, I, was, yeah. I was hoping we could actually take, I want to take a couple of the audience questions that have come in because I think they're some of them were really interesting. We'll, we'll do maybe two or three right now and then, and then keep going. Uh, and so, and we'll try and do this a bit quick first. So there's, there's one question here about kind of Quebec and Montreal, which I think is interesting. And uh, Paul, maybe we go to you. I know, I know you, you, you pay attention to that jurisdiction. So best sources of information from media to track and grasp, you know, what's going on in Montreal, what's going on in Quebec, why the number of cases appears to be higher and yet their approach sort of appears to be different and that I, I take it from the spirit of the question that this person is just not sure sort of it's not really an opinion it's just not sure where to turn or who, who to read to get to get good information so Le Devoir has a very good uh um sort of dashboard page on their website where they track uh under different tabs um the evolution of the Canadian caseload the uh, Quebec caseload overall, and then various regions. Um, it's, uh, I mean, Le Devoir is like kind of the old gray lady of Quebec media. It's, it's, it's um, you don't expect them to be as visually compelling as they have had to learn how to be recently. And, and their website has, I think the best uh, charts and graphs uh, of this epidemic. Uh, La Presse has um, really superb analysis and commentary. Um, and um, I mean, I, I could go on. A, a, a lot of, I mean, I really have been impressed with the extent to which the, the large Montreal news organizations have stepped up to the challenge of um, covering Montreal as the worst hit uh, center of this of this epidemic. And and um, uh, the Journal de Montréal for their commentary, which I often disagree with. Uh, Montreal Gazette, specifically for the reporting of Aaron Derfel, their uh, health reporter, who's uh, uh, started at the Gazette the same day I did in, uh, a long time ago. Uh, Aaron uh, really uh, uh, broke the lid off the uh, catastrophe in long-term care homes and has been one of the strongest reporters on it. So um, uh, it almost doesn't I'm not too particular about which paper you look at, but the Montreal newspapers have all been doing really fine work on this. Susan, maybe you to the next one, then Troy, I've got a question for you after this. So, so similar question for New York. I, I don't know if you if you have an opinion here, but 
Um, the, the question is sort of around, you know, you, the, you've got this kind of collision of views um, from, you know, Dr. Fauci, from NAAD, from the White House, you know, who, who should we be right, reading or who should we be paying attention to make sense of what's going on in, in Washington? <laughs> it may reveal it, but the New York Times, of course, and the Washington Post. Um, I think that, you know, I, I watch CNN every night. Um, I, th I guess that makes me a, a raging lefty. Um, I think they've kind of tried to rein it in a little bit, unless the later you get at night, you know, Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo gets a little wacky. But um, but I, I, I the, the New York Times and the Washington Post have been doing a really, really good job at, at sort of tracking this, um, what is going on in the United States. I can tell you from our readership in the Star, the biggest stories in the Star that people want to read, Canadians want to read, um, is Canadians want to read how we are different from the United States. Every one of those stories we, we run, um, talking about how Trump is going one way and Trudeau is going another way. Uh, people are listening to that. Uh, I actually think Canadians watch, I, I don't have, Troy probably has numbers on this. Um, I think people watch American news a lot and take their cues from that as well. And I think the alarm about COVID actually only started building here in Canada when Americans got alarmed. And I think Canadians are alarmed now just judging from what I see, um, or curious about how one country, our biggest neighbor, can be going one way and we can be going the other. And it, it sort of crystallized when you saw Doug Ford, uh, who we haven't talked about. Uh, Doug, Doug Ford has become like, um, it, people are depending on his briefings every day too for information, not as much as you get from Legault in Quebec. But I find I'm watching for Doug Ford uh, because he's talking to people where they live. Uh, and that's proved very handy in this. Um, but when you, you've seen Doug Ford now two or three times coming out and saying, um, I don't want those borders open. I don't want Americans here. I am mad at Donald Trump. You know, the, um, the interesting difference between Canada and the United States exposed again by this uh, pandemic is going to be something we're going to be talking and writing about for a while. I, I know um, I, I tried to get one of those custom made jackets that, that, that like has like a crest on it and says like executive director Mark Healy and it's got like a Canadian <laughs> I, couldn't get, I just couldn't get a tailor to make me an emergency measures jacket. No, I, I, we, we you know we've talked a lot about him here and how you know like he has he has been impressive our communications faculty are super impressed uh, with, with what, you know, what he's done in a relatively short period of time, C coming from a place that, that wasn't, it sort of wasn't the same thing, right? Uh, yeah. Troy, question, question for you, Troy, it came specifically for you. So it says, given the cutbacks on, on ad spending, you know, is there a role for uh, ad agencies, marketing communications agencies, PR agencies to provide additional value right now? In other words, could you be looking to not just inside, but to partners outside to help right now? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of things that are very basic to um, to ad agencies. Uh, number one, I think they we, we need to get past the, the ad agency bias that demos of 18 to 49 year olds or 25 to 54 year olds are all that count. Ad agencies uh, who are have most of their buyers are 20 somethings on the uh, on the buying floor, um, uh, don't live in the same world as the vast majority of consumers and they devalue or get for free a mass swath of the population. So they are paying for a show that will have over a million viewers like the CTV national news will every night. Uh, they will buy that show much, much cheaper than they will for a show with half a million viewers um, just because the demos are different. And uh, uh, so I think we just need to dispense with, uh, with, with the breaking of uh, people into demos because weirdly enough, those same ad buyers in the online space are happy to just pay for the click. You know, they're not, they don't know who's, uh, who's on the other end and they'll pay the CPM, but in TV and radio, they're, um, they're, they're basically getting a two thirds of the audience for free consistently and, and undervaluing news properties. 
even though the research has always showed that ads which appear in journalism, uh, uh, journalism-based programs, have a much, uh, they have the sort of good housekeeping seal of approval to them. Trustworthiness is higher. Every piece of research has shown this, that the more that an ad is next to content that is deemed trustworthy um, and requires active attention as news content does, it's not necessarily lean back content, um, the stickier that content, the stickier those ads are for consumers. So uh, simply taking an active effort in the agencies to look at their own value proposition and try to, you know, work with facts and increase the value that's put on news content would be very helpful. Um, but beyond that, there's been a shift, there's been a lot of shift recently to more attempts at content integration, both in newspapers and in, uh, and in electronic journalism. Um, and I think those can be done in a ways that supports editorial uh, and agencies can certainly take on a role in championing the message of, uh, of local media, of the importance of granular fact-based information in their own promotions on behalf of their clients and on behalf of their industry. And, uh, and there's nobody better at marketing than, than the marketing industry. Um, and I think all of us in the news media could use their support. Fair enough. Well, let's, let's do one more. Uh, it's, you know, it's a question about the type of story that, you know, is there a role for and does it, does it get coverage and does it drive eyeballs? Is there, is there still a role for process stories about government or inner working stories about government as opposed to the facts? How government is operating, how they're making decisions, what's happening behind the scenes as opposed to the press conference? <clears throat> I, I can leap in there and uh, I, I can't give you data, but I watched for this through the election uh, really carefully. And um, I, you know, I'm always afraid to go look at the STARS data numbers in case I see that horoscope cat videos are uh, the biggest thing. Good news is they're not. Um, that uh, the biggest readership we got during the election was for uh, explainers. Uh, and the, the, the biggest hits we get for stories, uh, in, again, if we're talking about what people want to read rather than what they need to read, uh, people want to read um, behind the scenes stories, how the go government got to this decision, um, what's involved. People want the news explained to them. And I think that's, uh, I don't think they want, there was no appetite or zero appetite, my colleagues were sorry to find out in those stories on the election campaign from the buses. Nobody cared what leader was saying what from the foot, the, the steps of a bus during the campaign. That's not interesting. Uh, what they do want help in is, again, as I said, in, in sorting information. Um, they don't want rewrites of news releases. They don't want, um, uh, they also, though, don't want, especially during this pandemic, I've seen, they don't want a lot of uh, Justin Trudeau is an idiot stuff. You know, they, there's no appetite at all for stories about party fights and partisanship. Not, uh, and I'm kind of glad of that, too, because it's tiresome. Um, but the, the, the stories about, um, you know, retrospective, who was an idiot in this crisis? Was it Andrew Scheer or was it Justin Trudeau? No interest. Um, I, I think there's, um, we get accused of, 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 of uh, um, selling ourselves out for cheap page views. Oh, you're just going after the, you're just going after the click. And what I found is there are, uh, there are not a lot of cheap page views. There's a very direct and almost ruthless uh, uh, relationship between the amount of work you have to put in journalistic, intellectual, moral, and the audience you're going to get. Um, I, I, uh, uh, this crisis put me in uh, writer's block uh, to an extent I haven't had. I spent a couple of weeks just wondering why I'm a journalist uh, because there's a global crisis and there's thousands of news sources and I didn't know what my value add was. And then I thought, well, you're still getting paid so you better figure something out. So I, I went away for three <laughs> weeks and I read 30 years worth of academic uh, writing on um, uh, pandemic prevention. And I spoke to the pioneers in that field and I produced 6,000 words on how uh, physicians and public health officials and academics had spent their careers 
planning for a moment like this, and yet it still hadn't gone very well. And it was hard uh, to read. It's it's a it's a it's a it was a very deep dive, and it and it asked a lot of the readers. And of course, it got lakes more of an audience than anything I've written in the last three years, except some of the uh, SNC level and stuff. Um, the audience is looking for serious work, and it rewards serious work, and it is not super interested right now in work that is less serious. Right. Uh, we're held to our highest standards by our audience more often than not. I, yeah. my, my only counter to that is that uh, one of our top stories, performing stories of last week, was Elon Musk's baby's name. So, <laughs> But the thing is, he's Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> That alone makes it complicated, and just writing out that baby's name. Yeah, did you do you have the right do you have the right characters on your keyboard? I, even, could, even I could not pronounce it for sure. I I can tell you that this is not said by way of any. The, the two biggest stories I've uh, had with by by sort of astronomical amount of hits, uh, very uh, in the early days of the pandemic was uh, a story I did on the, the relationship between Christopher Freeland and Doug Ford. Um, and that was massive, massive, massive. Um, and a quick one I did, sort of going against what Paul just said about the amount of work that you put into a piece. Uh, one afternoon, I said to my boss, do you want a quick story on how Canada is handling pandemic and Trump like they handled the free trade things, the, the free trade thing? So I just laid out to your point, Mark, about sort of what happens behind the scenes in the trade thing and how they were applying the lessons to the pandemic. And that got, I'd say 200 times the normal clicks of anything. It's like, like unbelievable, record setting. And I don't really understand that myself. I thought, who's putting this out there? But there, it, it tells you that, uh, to go to Paul's point, that, that people wanna be rewarded with some sense of knowledge about what is going? Uh, what is going on in Ottawa? You are paid to be there in Ottawa and tell me what's happening. Tell me what's happening. And you're not there to bring down the government. That's another rant. We can have some other time. I uh, I have this old belief, um, again self interested, that uh, the journalists who have political science degrees don't think it's their job to take down the government. They think that's the opposition's job, and um, there was a, there's another sort of uh, cadre of journalists who do believe it's their job to bring down governments. And I, you know, again, a whole other story, but um, accountability means two different things. We're, um, we're, we're running out of time. We, we started um, with some notes on, or my, I guess my notes on the, the sort of messy future that lies ahead of us in my view anyway. What, what does the future hold for the media and for, for the news media in Canada? How, what, what is the other end? Is there another end? Is that, a, is that a point in time that anybody's thinking about? And what, is it, what does it look like? Do we not have printed papers anymore? What, what, what's going to happen here? Hmm. I, I'm yeah, sure I, I hear I, what, I, I just, I'm especially curious to hear what Troy uh, um, has to say, because he worries about this for a living. Um, I, I believe that there are large news organizations that have not yet failed that will. Uh, I believe that there are uh, um, sort of the clever little rodents of the dinosaur age, sm small <laughs> startups, people we haven't yet heard of who are just gonna run rings around us. And a lot of them with a conception of what journalism is that most, most longtime journalists find repugnant. Uh, um, uh, barely disguised lies, uh, harsh partisanship, uh, uh, preaching to the converted, uh, like that's just going to be around and, 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 and hoping it goes away, I don't think it's going to work. Um, and I also think that everyone uh, who wants to do good journalism should uh, always be aware that there are a bunch of different possible fora for doing good journalism, live events, podcasts, um, and uh, books. Uh, um, I'm constantly on the lookout. It's now getting to be too long since I published my last book for a story that I could fall in love with enough that I would want to tell it at book length. Um, so the, the, the constant cut and thrust of trying to be relevant on Twitter and so on 
uh, matters for a lot of people can't be ignored, but there are other ways, there are other ways to find your, your, your way to, to, to make your shot. And the, the cost of entry are lower than they've ever been. Anyone who's got something to say can find a way to say it. And uh, that's often annoying for those of us who used to be in the gated communities of journalism, but it's just the way things are. Dave, uh, go ahead. Just, just. I, I, was, I was just gonna say, I think um, what Paul and I have had in common in the places we've worked is that um, the Toronto Star is not hand delivered to people in Ottawa and the McLean's only comes out once a week. So we had to learn, and I don't think it was just that we were on the fourth floor of the National Press Building. I always marveled at the way McLean's and the Star actually glided right in there into the early days of the internet because we wanted to be read by decision makers in Ottawa, right? That was our, our hope. I had actually, I, I hope if, if my bosses are out there that they don't hear this, um, I, I actually don't mind the idea that the paper journalism goes away. I would actually thought during this pandemic, it might be a good idea. Delivering something tactile to people's doors doesn't seem like a smart idea. And that we kind of get our minds around the idea of what journalism is, I, uh, what digital journalism is. I always compare it to when, when TV first came along, it was all about putting on shows on, on stage because people were still doing the old, uh, they were thinking that theater had to turn into TV. And I still think we're in a stage where we still think the newspaper has to, it, the, the internet has to look like the newspaper online. We haven't totally got our minds around that yet, but I do think I'm in my optimistic days when I think that I'll still have a job by the end of this year. Um, I I think that uh, that this could be a time for reinvention. I I think that the um, you know Paul makes a great point that we're as much as some of us in the in the mass media uh, you know wish these uh, highly partisan barely truth-telling uh, media outlets would go away. That's not going to happen uh, unless someone uh, is prepared to, you know, crack down on free speech and the internet, which I think would be alarming for all of us. Um, so we have to acknowledge that they're there. If there is a role for regulators or the government, it's um, requiring more transparency. There are media outlets out there that are entirely uh, financed um, by donors and unions, for instance, that are pushing a certain message. There are others that don't reveal their donors at all and are pushing a very different message um, and, and call themselves journalists, but aren't journalists in any way, shape or form uh, in terms of how they perform, but they post articles that are designed to sway viewpoints. We have to acknowledge that's there. And I think if there's any role in curtailing it, it is only in trying to require transparency on, on how they operate. Um, I think we're gonna to continue to see a shift to new platform delivery. Just uh, last month, we launched um, you know, Global News uh, as an online streaming channel. Uh, you know, we saw what's happened with cable television and cable subscriptions in decline and people not wanting to pay for cable and pick and pay and all of that. So we launched our new uh, news channels on the web and uh, on the app and on Amazon Prime. And the numbers have been incredible in the first month, like wow. off the charts successful uh, in terms of audience. Again, not a lot of advertising there at the moment, but that kind of new platform innovation is going to have to continue. I think uh, to support journalism long-term, we're going to have to see some kind of shift in the burden. Um, and I'm very hopeful that some effort will, uh, will, and the world's gonna have to tackle this to make the web giants pay. That may be um, wishing into the wind, um, but I think it's, it's an effort that needs to be tackled because we can't have tax credits and other direct funding uh, and maintain trustworthiness as well as maintain balanced books in Ottawa. And lastly, one that's specific to the electronic sector is, uh, and I'll make my pitch here, uh, which is what I same one I made before the finance committee in Ottawa last week. And that is, you know, we don't need to subsidize uh, electronic media or at least not television media in this country. We do need to understand the level of burdens, uh, regulatory burden that's been put on the television sector over decades. In that it's not only requirements to do news, which I think is the most important public interest service that our networks provide, 
but there are also additional burdens. We have requirements to do certain levels of Canadian content spending. We have certain requirements to spend on particular genres of Canadian content, on programs of national interest, the number of documentaries, the number of dramas, the fact we have to spend with independent producers. The list goes on and on. It is. It would make your head spin if you knew how many regulations that Canadian broadcasters face in terms of the kinds of programmings were required by government to produce and broadcast at a loss at a time when we also have to commit to performing our key public service function, which is providing journalism. And if the government wants to uh, ensure that television journalism, which loses money across the board, survives, then it needs to do that by taking some of those other burdens off of the broadcast sector. Should we just should we just vote now? I think we have a quorum. Sean can be the, be the tiebreaker if if, it, if push comes to shove here. We're um we're just about out of time. So I, I was hoping we could do maybe is it, just let's get a closing thought from each of you and then we'll, and then we'll sort of wrap it up. But Troy, Troy, why don't we start with you? Closing thoughts on on all of this. Uh, as, as much as, you know, so, sometimes you get into these discussions and it seems kind of pessimistic and, um, uh, you know, that there's a threat to democracy. Uh, and in a way there is. Um, but I also speak before a lot of journalism classes every year. I, uh, I'm sure Susan and Paul do as well, go around and, and talk to uh, journalism students. The amount of passion that continues to exist in young people uh, to enter this industry, to make a difference, to be able to uh, be truth tellers, to promote accountability is incredible. And the amount of innovation that continues to happen on a yearly basis is incredible. We, uh, yes, have done a lot of layoffs. Uh, 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 and I'm speaking specifically for the television industry. We've done a lot of layoffs over the last decade, uh, but I think we pr probably employ more journalists than we ever have. And that's because most of those layoffs were of back-end technical positions. There's a lot of newsroom positions, but there weren't people who were actually involved in creation and dissemination of news. And, uh, and with the advent of new platforms, uh, with, um, you know, with cross-platform distribution of media, there are new opportunities emerging and, and solid journalism is going to survive. It needs to be protected. It needs to be encouraged, but it's going to survive. Susan? I'm going to, I'm going to stay optimistic. I have had dark moments of the soul like Paul has too about, uh, about this business. But um, one thing that we have learned in the past uh, eight weeks or so is that government has a role in people's lives um, to an extent that I had. And I think we were, that was bubbling before the pandemic. And just as government has a role in public uh, the people's lives, so does the media. And uh, you know, this is a time where we're all sitting back and thinking about what is vital and what is important, and keeping uh, some sense of connectedness in a disconnected, isolated world. Uh, that seems to be a perfect job for the media. Paul, final word to you. Um, there's a moment in, uh, there was a, a documentary about the life of the great journalist uh, and author Joan Didion, where somebody asked her what it was like to come across a, a, a four or five year old kid who was doing drugs in, a, in uh, San Francisco in the, in the 60s and, and uh, like the most horrible scene you could possibly imagine. And Joan Didion says, let me tell you, it was gold because she's a journalist and, and, and the, the glory of this life and the, and, the, and the horror of it is, I keep reminding myself every couple of days, this is one of probably the three greatest stories of my life. Uh, I've been at this for 30 years and there was the referendum in Quebec in 1995, which mattered to my home audience at the Montreal Gazette. There was post 911 and there's this. And uh, of course we're horrified. And of course each of us feels a personal obligation to keep our own families safe. And each of us understands that the politicians who are struggling with this, A, they signed up for politics, they never signed up for this. They have no idea what the next step is. And they're, and they're honestly doing their best all the time. Um, and, and what I keep reminding myself, try to remind colleagues, is whenever you retire, whenever you look back on your career, these are gonna be the greatest moments of your life. So what are you doing today to, to, to measure up to that challenge? And um, it's, uh, it's hard. Everything we do depends on being with people and, and seeing how they react and we can't do that. Um, yeah. But that's, uh, that's what separates 
the, the, the people who will remember this time with some satisfaction with the people who are going to spend the rest of their life regretting it. Uh, it's it, uh, found actually. Uh, insightful comments from, from everyone were as usual up against time. We could easily go another hour here, but um, let our audience go. Sean, uh, what happens from here, please? The full recording will be on our YouTube channel at Ivy Academy, uh, as well as ivyacademy.com. We'll also try to follow up with some extra resources. I, I mentioned I, I saw a couple of, uh, of good sources recommended by our panelists. And so we'll follow up offline and try to, to give our audience members some links there. Great. And we promised that we would send specifically send the recording to Susan's boss, right? So she could yeah. <laughs> hear the comments verbatim. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Never read the comments. Uh, we're, we're over time, I'm going to I'm going to take the yeah I'm going to take the opportunity to thank our guests Paul and Susan and Troy. Great great job. Thanks so much for making time. I know you're all busy. Crazy time. Appreciate it. Sean, Thanks great job today. Sure. Everybody who tuned in, appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Thanks, thank guys. you, Mark. Thank you.